Hi everyone, today I'm here with Dr. Chan, a neurosurgeon who's been practicing in the field for over 15 years and he has his own uh, neurosurgery uh, clinic. Uh, so today, first of all, thank you Dr. Chan for agreeing to the interview. Great, thanks. thanks for having me. Um, and before we get into kind of the specifics of your experiences in the field, could you briefly go over what neurosurgery is? So neurosurgery is basically uh, surgical treatment of neurological problems in the brain, the spinal cord and peripheral nerves, and the most common things that we see in our practice is going to be spine, degenerative, and things of that nature. Uh, I also have a lot of interest in brain cases, so things like brain tumors, aneurysms, uh, uh, anything in the head that may require surgery will kind of fall into the category of neurosurgery. And then peripheral nerve, which isn't really a large part of my practice, uh, it's basically things like brachial plexus tumors, brachial plexus problems, uh, as well as peripheral uh, elbow um, nerves, as well as carpal tunnel and more common things like that. So those are kind of the three parts of neurosurgery that fits in our body. Okay, and uh, what are the subspecialties of neurosurgery? Uh, there's actually quite a few subspecialties. Um, there's people like me who basically does general neurosurgery and we do a little of everything. Uh, one of the more popular subspecialties is spine. So that's basically uh, what my partner does a lot of. A lot of uh, universities do have spine sections where they do a lot of very uh, complex spines, scoliosis, deformities, a lot of traumas, fractures. Um, another subspecialty would be tumors and that's one of my area of interest. Uh, so brain tumors, spine tumors, and things of that nature. Uh, vascular um, is a pretty big subspecialty in neurosurgery and it's kind of an evolution. In the old days, vascular neurosurgery was basically treatment of vascular problems with surgery. So things like aneurysms, we would treat it by opening up the head and clipping the aneurysms. And now there's been a change in the section of neurosurgery called vascular where a lot of uh, neurosurgeons and even non-neurosurgeons, whether they're neurologists or interventional radiologists, would come in and do some of the procedures called endovascular. So that's when they do the catheters and they put in wires and they squirt uh, chemicals into aneurysms, they put coils into aneurysms, they can put uh, medications into arteriovenous malformations and obliterate those uh, malformations. Um, and so that's a, a changing and evolving a subspecialty of neurosurgery. Pain and functional stereotactic neurosurgery is another specialty that isn't as well known. They do things like deep brain stimulators for Parkinson's. They also do spinal cord stimulators and my partner actually does some of that uh, where they modulate the spinal cord to help reduce pain appreciation by the patients. Um, and they do the really uh, intense brain biopsies, the no man's land part of the brain where you really can't get to by opening. They put very, very small needles in through um, precise measurements on a frame and attach the frame to the patient's head and then place the needle in and get biopsies that way. So uh, that's another field. Uh, pediatric neurosurgery is actually a um, fellowship trained and board certified subspecialty. So it is so different than adult neurosurgery that it is a board certified special type of neurosurgery. So you can be board certified in neurosurgery and then if you treat kids, you have to be board certified in pediatric neurosurgery and they basically handle all the conditions that you see in little kids, um, a lot of which are congenital tumors, deformities and things like that, but also some of the more uh, common stuff that we think about when we, when we think about kids needing neurosurgery is things like um, spinal cord defects, uh, myelomeningocele and things of that nature. In neurosurgery we also have trauma, so trauma uh, is basically the neurosurgical treatment of patients who just get hit pretty hard by whatever it is to get hit by. Cars, motorcycles, anything or falls. Uh, also includes gunshot wounds and things of that nature. Trauma neurosurgery, just like trauma general surgery, is very heavy ICU care. So there is a subspecialty of neurosurgery that's critical care, but in reality a lot of the trauma neurosurgeons are very heavy into critical care as well. Epilepsy, that kind of falls into um, the functional and neurosur uh, functional and stereotactic neurosurgery component, so epilepsy is a treatment of epilepsy through neurosurgical means and that may be done through um, obliteration where they go in and cut out part of the brains that's making the patient have seizures or it may be placement of certain electrodes or um, neuromodulation devices like vagal nerve stimulators to kind of keep the patient from having symptoms or it may be the workup of epilepsy where they'll do grids under the skull so most patients with epilepsy they have EEGs where they monitor through the, skin, uh, through the skin and through the skull 
But if you really can't decipher the origin of the epilepsy, um, some neurosurgeon will actually open up the head and place the grid on the brain and close the head back up. And for a week, you will have the grids on the brain so it can actually record very uh, low level uh, epileptic form discharges so that you can pick up and see well, what's the cause of problem for epilepsy for this patient. Let's see, what else is there? Oncology? I'm looking at my list of books and it has all the different specialties. Uh, but those are the main big ones. And within them, they also have different uh, subspecialties. So within spine, you have people who does deformity. Within um, tumor and vascular, they have people do what I like to do, which is called skull base, where they operate on the, on the bottom part of the skull, which is where the olfactory groove is and where the posterior fossa, the sphenoid ridge is. And the reason why that's a, almost a, a specialty into itself is because unlike tumors on the surface of the brain where you just go in, open up the head, and just scoop the tumor out. The ones on the base of the brain, you've got holes in the skull, all these foramens, you've got blood vessels, you've got nerves, you've got all these delicate structures that really can't be disturbed, so operating there becomes a little bit more complex. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like a hybrid junction between vascular and tumor. So what are the most common cases that you usually see? So for private practice neurosurgeons like myself, um, the most common cases we see are going to be spine. 90% uh, of the patient that comes into my office is going to be spine, so they're going to have neck problems, they're going to have lower back problems. Most people think, well, neck problems or lower back problems must be a slip disc, but actually that's pretty uncommon. We do get slip disc patients. In fact, I have a surgery on Friday for a slip disc, but we see a lot of degenerative disc, and what that means is that this dries out and it flattens, it has no support for the spine. As a result, it bulges, and then the bones lay down bone spurs to reinforce the weakened disc, and those bone spurs and the flattened disc as they bulge out takes up room on the side where the nerves come out and that pinches the nerves and that causes pain shooting to the legs, what we call sciatica. Uh, and then we go in and we shave some of that bone and disc construct off and make room for those nerves. And then that is probably one of the more common things that I see. Mm -hmm. A lot of patients may come in where their generation is so severe that the bones, they don't hold snugly together like duct tape together. They kind of just wobble and they're loose. We, we call that unstable, so they're unstable. And patients like that, if you start removing bone, you'll make them even more unstable. So as a result, we end up having to do surgeries called fusions, where we put screws and rods and lock it in, and we put bone grafts to make it heal around our screws and rods. Mm -hmm. And then that, in conjunction with our decompression, gives them the result they need if they have instability. Mm -hmm. But the majority of our cases really are um, spine, and I think in private practice that's really the case. Since I do have interest in skull base and vascular, I do get some of that. The one thing that I've seen a lot of and I do a lot of are pituitary tumors, and that call falls partially into skull base and partially into pituitary, and I actually do the surgery with a colleague of mine, uh, an ENT surgeon named Dr. Gropo, mm -hmm. and he helps go through the nose to the back. We open up the sphenoid sinus, but he opens it up, and then I come in after him, and then at the back of the sphenoid sinus is the skull base, and I open that little eggshell bone, and then we're right in the cella tersica. And that's when we start removing the tumor out by going through the nose. And then he repairs it at the end, closes everything up, and then we just keep them in ICU for a couple of days looking for some of the hormonal disturbances like diabetes insipidus or SIADH. Mm -hmm. uh, usually within three to four days, they'll present with those problems, and you want to keep them in ICU to watch these patients so usually I do that uh, after we take out the tumor, and that's one of the more common cranial uh, switch, uh, procedures that I do, um, but I also do brain tumors like glioblastomas, uh, meningiomas, either on a skull base or on a surface, um, and occasional aneurysm. I don't get as much aneurysm now as I did in training in Chicago, because in Chicago we were at a vascular program, so we got a lot of aneurysms, and a lot of them were ruptured, and you were taking the surgery. Well, here in Sacramento, in private practice, a lot of the aneurysms I get are non unruptured and they're elective, and a lot of the aneurysms are treated with endovascular coiling, so they don't really need to have someone go in and put a clip across the neck unless they're really complex or unless they have a wide neck, and if you put a coil into a wide neck aneurysm, you end up blocking off the daughter vessels and you cause strokes, so then you need someone like me to go in and put a clip across the neck. What was your path to medicine and specifically to your field of neurosurgery? It varies from person to person and, and what I've experienced through my residency and my co-residents is that we actually didn't go to med school to become doctors. Mm -hmm. We went to med school to become neurosurgeons. Mm -hmm. And across the board with all my co-residents in Chicago, that was kind of what we all pretty much 
agreed on. At least that's what was our common uh, uniting factor. Mm -hmm. And so when I was um, in college, I was actually a business major, and then I switched to neurobiology because I like mm -hmm. I like the curriculum, but I didn't really think about well, what do I do with a neurobiology major? Mm -hmm. You know, if I don't want to be a professor or mm -hmm. teach school. Ultimately, I went into business. And during that time, it wasn't very enriching. So I ended up doing some volunteer work and looking around and thinking, what, what else can I do? And I happened to meet a neurosurgeon at UCSF. And he brought me in and we started working on research projects. He had me around with him. And this was at the trauma center in San Francisco. And so when you're a pre-med student and you see neurosurgical trauma and emergencies, it's very exciting and it makes a strong impression. And you know, at that point, I've already met with orthopedic surgeons I met with general surgeons, internists, I met with pathologists and radiologists, and it didn't really quite connect. So I wasn't really feeling like I wanted to be in a family practice um, setting or in a radiology setting or anything of that nature. I even worked in the ER, and I thought that would really kind of excite me a bit, but I really didn't connect with it. But in neurosurgery, it really connected, and it's one of those where once it hit, it was so obvious that that would be the right thing. And ultimately, I think that's what a lot of my colleagues, you know, when, when they entered medical school, they really have that feeling like, hey, I'm really here just for one thing, for neurosurgery, because that's what drew me to medicine. I'm not so much interested in this other stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm just really interested in neurosurgery. And, and that kind of was the way for me. So I kept a very narrow focus. Uh, applying to medical school and going through medical school and just really focused on neurosurgery itself. Mm -hmm. But having said that, there are many people who didn't do what I do. Mm -hmm. One of my interns when I was chief, um, he rotated in neurosurgery on the advice of one of his buddies who rotated with us and said, man, that was a lot of fun, you need to rotate with these guys. Mm -hmm. He came, I think, as a either a third or fourth year student, took the neurosurgery rotation with us, had a great time and decided, man, I really want to do neurosurgery. And it would seem that if you're a fourth year med student and you decide to go into neurosurgery, mm -hmm. it's probably a little too late, mm -hmm. right? Because most people are like me, where MS1, you're doing a research paper, you're already plugged in, you did all your sub eyes, you got all your letters, and everything is lined up for neurosurgery. But in fact, he actually did neurosurgery, even as a late applicant. He matched with us. Um, he didn't get a lot of interviews because... He, you know, he was a good applicant, but he just didn't look neurosurgical at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But we liked him, so he ended up matching with us, which is great. And he graduated a year and a half ago, and he's also in practice now. So he, he, he did very well, and he was a very good resident as well. So there are many different paths to the same goals. Um, so not everybody has to be as focused as me. They can be like my intern, where he wasn't quite as focused, but still was able to achieve uh, a neurosurgical goal. What's a typical um, day in your life like from when you come in to when you leave? The reason why I'm in private practice or why I'm in this particular practice is because my life is actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. So what I do is not really representative of what happens at UC Davis or UCSF. Mm -hmm. It's not really happens in other people's practices at Sutter or at Kaiser where they may have a lot more um, busyness and a lot more constraints. So my practice is pure private practice. We're independent. We're not part of Sutter. We're not part of Kaiser. We're not part of Mercy. We have privileges at several hospitals, including Mercy and Sutter, and we can go anywhere we want. We're completely private, and we bring them business. Uh, as a result, the only boss I have is my patients. I don't have someone telling me when to work or how much to work. I just basically work as my patients require me to work, which sometimes means that you're working on Christmas Eve if they need it, which also means that you get your Christmas off and no one really needs you. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, there's a lot more freedom in my schedule. Mm -hmm. So usually I try not to work on weekends. That's not always the case, but sometimes um, I may do have to come in on weekends. But for the most part, I get my weekends off and my partner does as well. Because we're a private practice, we have an option of taking emergency coverage. When I do emergency coverage, I feel like I'm back in residency and it gets very busy. You get called at two in the morning, you get called by the ER, you may have emergencies. When I'm not on emergency call, it doesn't feel like I'm in neurosurgery at all. It feels almost like family medicine. So things are very quiet. There are evenings, you get to go to sleep. You go to work when you go to work. You go to surgery when you're scheduled. And everything is very low-key and benign. So my Mondays and Thursdays, I have my elective surgeries. I do my big surgeries on Mondays, smaller surgeries on Thursdays. Everybody's home on Friday and my weekend is off. 
Mm -hmm. uh, my Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays I have clinic, and I basically just see patients. So my surgery day starts at 7.30, so I'm in the hospital around 6.30 or 6 o'clock, and I'm getting everything set up, uh, seeing patients that were here from the night before or something, uh, if there are patients in-house. Um, and then I do my surgeries, and when I'm done with surgeries, I'm basically done for the day. Occasionally, I would have clinic in the afternoons, but for the most part, I have my surgeries, and then the other day, I have my clinic, so I don't mix them up so that I'm looking at the clock while I'm operating. I don't want to do that. So I just do my surgery, and then when I'm done, I'm done. On my clinic days, usually I'm in the office um, about 7 a.m., so I'm rounding at about 6.30 or 6 o'clock in the morning, and then at 7 o'clock, I'm in my office, Patient gets there around 8 or 8.30, and I just see patients right through the day until about 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, mm -hmm. sometimes 5, usually not. Uh, so usually I do get my afternoons free, but it also has a built-in spot so that if I need to, I can add patients on the afternoon. If it's an urgent case, if a doctor calls and says, hey, can you see this patient for me today? The answer is yes. We have a spot just to see them at the end of the day and get them in. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so that's my Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And I try to keep a Friday clinic so that if there's any pending issues, patients with issues during the week, instead of having them spend the weekend without access to me, uh, we get them in on a Friday, give them disposition, and then they're okay for the weekend. So they don't have any worrisome issues where they say, oh, I better go to the ER on Saturday. No, usually we see them on Friday, get them all tucked in so they're okay for the rest of the week. Uh, you mentioned... Uh, you have that kind of flexibility with like a pure, purely private practice. How is the lifestyle of maybe like more of a, a neurosurgeon working more of like, like a typical non completely private practice setting different from that of other specialties? I'm, I'm assuming it'd be a lot more intense. Yeah, it is, and and there's really three models for neurosurgery, and probably three models for a lot of um, a lot of medical specialties. One, the first model is my model, which is pure private practice. I'm in my own practice. I own my own practice. Uh, and we don't answer to anybody. We just basically bill for surgeries through the insurance company. We don't have a salary. So whatever we make is what we take home. If we operate more, we make more money. And we see more patients. If we want more time off, we operate less, we make less money, we see less patients. And that's really our choice. And that's probably a, um, a dying model. I think given the reform of medical care and insurance, uh, fewer people are able to sustain this model. Mm -hmm. uh, only reason why my partner and I can't do it is because this practice began in the 80s and we have a very strong referral network mm -hmm. uh, which really helps us keep getting patients. Mm -hmm. uh, the second model is the private employed neurosurgeon where they work for Kaiser or Sutter or Mercy where they get a salary and they see a required number of patients. If they see more, they get bonuses. If they see less, I don't think they're allowed to see less. They have to see that amount. Uh, so, so they basically are employed by their foundation or by the group, and they do surgery on those patients and really those patients only. Um, and the benefit of that is that you have job security. You've got all your insurance paid for. All your overhead is covered by Sutter or by Kaiser or by Mercy. You have nothing to worry about, no headaches. You don't own your own business. You're an employee. Just like if you work at McDonald's, your employee, you don't have to worry about doing anything other than your job. Uh, and then the third model is the academic neurosurgeon. And that's basically uh, working in a university setting. Um, there are people like me who have privileges at medical schools, but we're still mainly part of practice. So the academic neurosurgeon works for the university. So whether it's UCSF or Stanford or UC Davis, they are a... Um, doctor for that particular university. So they're in a professorship, they're, they do research, they have students, they have residents, um, and they basically have a salary like the employed, and they are employed, uh, and they also have um, bonuses, what they call RVUs, where if they do more, they get extra. Um, some neurosurgeons like that model. I think if you like to teach if you like um, research, I think that's really the model to go for. Mm -hmm. If you like more patient care and less of the politics of academic medicine, then private practice is the way to go. And if you really just want to punch your clock nine to five and say, man, I just want a job. I don't want to worry about giving bonuses or hiring office managers or hiring secretaries or mm -hmm. worrying about rent or any of that stuff, um, then the employed model would be good. So those three models have a, a spot for everybody. and. Uh, it depends on what each person wants out of their career. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. but in terms of uh, workload, 
uh, I would say that the emergency uh, that shows up, it doesn't really matter whether you're employed or private or academic, any emergency that's going to show up could potentially be the same for all three, mm -hmm. uh, all three types of uh, neurosurgeons. In terms of compensation, I'm sure like any neurosurgeon would be compensated like very well um, compared to like other specialties too. What's the general compensation ranges of like neurosurgeons and what tips would you give like new neurosurgeons to maximize their income? You know, the neuro neurosurgeons I think do make quite a bit. Um, I'll tell you what my mentors told me. Take care of the patients and the money will take care of itself. Uh, and it will. Uh, if you do a good job taking care of patients, you're going to get more business than you can handle, mm -hmm. and then you'll make plenty of money. And how much or how little you want to make depends on um, what it is that your goal is. If you bought a brand new house, and you want to travel, and you got wife and kids, and you got a lot of bills, mm -hmm. you may want to work more. Mm -hmm. If you're single, you own your own house, you don't have any bills, no mortgage, uh, you may have the luxury of working as much as you want to mm -hmm. per the need of the patient. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm in that position where I, I don't really have a whole lot of expenses. Mm -hmm. So when I work and I bust my behind over a Christmas holiday, mm -hmm. it's because the patient says, man, I'm really scared. I want that surgery. Or if someone has cancer and I really want to take it out, mm -hmm. then I'll double book cases. But for the most part, there's very little financial motivation for me mm -hmm. to actually do neurosurgery. Mm -hmm. I think the, uh, the Becker Spine published uh, report for average neurosurgeon in America is about 750000 a year, mm -hmm. uh, which is about right. And on the higher end, it's probably about 1.2 to 1.3 million. Mm -hmm. There are neurosurgeons that probably make more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, there's places somewhere in the middle of nowhere where they really don't have the resources to pay that much. Mm -hmm. And you see neurosurgeons who may make fractions of that. Mm -hmm. But on average, they're well compensated um, for what they do. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, it's also the longest, it is the longest mm -hmm. training process. So most of the neurosurgeons coming out are in their mid to late 30s to 40s. Mm -hmm. And now they're starting to actually make money. So for mm -hmm. people interested in neurosurgery, you know, the best advice is, Neurosurgery is not a good place to go to make money. Mm -hmm. It's a good place to go if you really can't do anything else because you don't want to. Mm -hmm. uh, the re attrition rate for neurosurgery is about 33%. Mm -hmm. So in my seven years in residency, we've had four people who were either let go or fired. Mm -hmm. um, and from what I understand from Northwestern, University of Chicago, as well as UCSF and Cleveland Clinic, same thing. Okay, and, and were they let go because they weren't able to keep up with the demands? or you know? Each person that was let go in our department will let go for different reasons. Um, I think uh, there are certain expectations of what is required of a neurosurgery resident. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, attrition in neurosurgery is not just neurosurgeons who lose their job. Uh, general surgeons, they have attrition, um, internal medicine. Every specialty has people who drop out for a variety of reasons. Even medical school, you start off with a certain number of medical students. Somewhere along the way, the numbers dwindle a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, the particular cases in my residency, there was an issue of a resident who wasn't quite right for his chief year, and they wanted him to remediate one year. He declined and he left. Mm -hmm. uh, we had another neurosurgeon who was a very good resident and good doctor, uh, and had some issues managing patients and there were some complications and he was let go because of the complications mm -hmm. He was asked back, but he declined to come back mm -hmm. um, And then we had one I remember there was an issue of integrity, you know uh, The problem was that he wasn't someone that was well trusted by our attendings and as a result uh, He basically was caught in a bold-faced lie, mm -hmm. uh, and that was pretty unacceptable. He was pretty much terminated on the spot. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a variety of reasons and whatnot throughout the years where someone may decide they're unable to continue, or the attendings may decide they cannot continue the resident. Mm -hmm. um, but the attrition rate, being as high as it is, does require some degree of commitment where you really have to say, I'm, I want to do this because I want it for me. You know, This is my goal. It's not because someone says you have to do this uh, and if you don't have that motivation it's really hard to keep up uh, year after year mm -hmm. to do the jobs that this particular specialty demands so mm -hmm. neurosurgery I think is one of the more demanding uh, subspecialties mm -hmm. uh, out there um, residency is a huge deterrent and mm -hmm. I think um, a number of folks 
don't make it through residency because it's so tough mm -hmm. and it's unusual for someone to make it through residency and then not make it through practice because when you're in practice you get to define how your practice is to, mm -hmm. some, to some extent mm -hmm. uh, and in my practice obviously you get to define it completely so you can set up the practice the way you want it you can make it as hard as easy as possible and if mm -hmm. you feel like you want to do more you can if you want to do less you can also do that mm -hmm. um, but in terms of um, motivation I think the passion for neurosurgery or the love of neurosurgery and the love of the work is probably the best motivator mm -hmm. to enter the field if you love neurosurgery and you really want to do it and you're, you know that you can commit to it Mm -hmm. And commitment to neurosurgery is one of those where you really want to make sure that it's not just about you. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're married, if you have family, uh, it really has to be a decision that the whole family can do because your success as a neurosurgeon does depend on their ability to get through mm -hmm. the residency as well as the practice of neurosurgery. Mm -hmm. As, as a family, as, as a whole. Mm -hmm. So there's all these talks about neurosurgeons have, having really high divorce rates and things. It's, it is true, there is some degree of that, but for the most part, I think if everybody knows what they're getting into, mm -hmm. I think the success rate can be very, very high. What's the most challenging aspect of neurosurgery? I think the most challenging aspect of neurosurgery is basically trying to take a step back away from neurosurgery and not be as heavily involved and at least in my practice what that means is there are some things that you can't control mm -hmm. so if I do a perfect surgery and the patient has bad diabetes and they continue to smoke mm -hmm. that's out of my control you can counsel them you can talk to them beforehand you can make sure they smoke check their meth hemoglobin before do all those things but the success or the failure of your surgery really is a collaboration between the neurosurgeon and the patient mm -hmm. and the patient's resources, family, family doctors, mm -hmm. um, and together can you get the results that you want. If it's basically the neurosurgeon alone, then you're probably not going to succeed if you're doing as much as you can, but the patient isn't really involved in their recovery. Mm -hmm. And any type of complications that you get, um, you kind of feel like it's out of your hands sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other difficulty with um, my practice is securing patient expectations. There's an idea that, you know, uh, if I go to the doctor, they'll fix everything. But fact mm -hmm. of the matter is, not everything can be fixed by a doctor. So mm -hmm. you kind of have to set up proper expectations on a patient base. Um, if you have surgery, here's what will happen, here's what won't happen. Mm -hmm. And it's not that all your problems will be fixed by this one surgery. We only fix the things we fix. So I think patient education and making sure they understand what to get out of the surgery uh, is pretty important. And that may be a stumbling block. And I think in the times where either I failed or patients are unhappy with the outcomes, a lot of it is the, fail the failure to meet their expectations, whether realistic or unrealistic. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, what are the most rewarding aspects of neurology or new surgery? Oh man, I know you used to say neurology. <laughs> you know what? I take it back. The, the, the biggest stumbling block of <laughs> neurosurgery is people who, who think I'm a neurologist, <laughs> which is actually pretty common. But as far as rewarding, uh, I think patient care. You know, um, you know, there are days when I go home and I'm not very happy with my life or my work or, or me or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and largely, it's because of patients. You know, if patients aren't happy and they're not happy with me, it really makes me feel bad and then I go home feeling kind of unhappy and that's what the success of my patients would be much more desirable obviously mm -hmm. even if it's out of my control and the vice versa is absolutely true if you do something and a patient does well if they're appreciative or they're not appreciative it almost doesn't matter as long as you can see the change and improvement mm -hmm. it, it, it will and it never gets old you know after 15 years of this you know you do a surgery patient wakes up they're doing great they go home they're happy uh, they, uh, they, they, they bring you gifts, <laughs> you know, uh, and thank you letters and things like that. Uh, it, it feels really good. And I think that is a fantastic uh, motivator to do not just what the patient needs, but above and beyond that for the patient. And a lot of times that really kind of makes my day. And it's one of those where 
you see a patient and your whole day is just perfect because they did great from the surgery yesterday. Are there any misconceptions about neurosurgery besides it being confused with neurology? Um, there's a lot. There's an idea that there's a procedure called surgery that will fix whatever it is that needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. And especially when it comes to spine, a lot of patients may have chronic pain mm -hmm. and radiographically they have degenerative changes and you read the radiology report and it sounds terrible, but when you look at it and you analyze for things that you can treat with surgery, whether it's decompression or fusion, the patient doesn't have that. Mm -hmm. and they don't have anything that's stenotic, there's no pinched nerves, they don't have any uh, instability, there's no movement in the spine segments, so there's really no role for a surgeon. Mm -hmm. But the patient clearly has pain, it has pain for many years. And you know, when they come in and they're angry and they're frustrated because they have pain for 5, 10, 20 years, and doctor after doctor tells them, hey, you know what, you, we can't help you, mm -hmm. then you know, they, they tend to be disappointed with mm -hmm. anything you're going to say unless you say, I have the treatment for you, it's going to make you perfect. So in that sense, um, there's definitely a limitation to what surgery can do. And a lot of patients don't realize that we only treat what we can treat. Mm -hmm. So the myth would be, hey, you know what? He just puts his hands on me and instantly I'm better. And that's absolutely not true. People think that neurosurgeon in particular, you know, so these guys have life and death in their hands. They control these things, but we don't. We don't get to make that choice. The only choice we get to make is life. We can't choose death. Um, if a patient doesn't want our care and they understand that uh, it may be fatal not to have surgery. You know, that's a decision that the patient comes up with with our help, informed consent. And in Chicago, we had a large vascular program, a lot of strokes, a lot of aneurysms, a lot of patients in very bad shape, some of whom come in comatose. Mm -hmm. And for those patients, we can't bring them back to life. We can't choose to let them live or die. And we just kind of guide the family to help them understand how bad their loved ones are and then help them come up to a decision that's best for them. Some of them will say, well, we, we want them on a breathing machine, we want to get a tracheostomy and have them on a ventilator for months, we, we want a feeding tube, we don't care, we just don't want them to go. Mm -hmm. Not the choice I would want to make for my loved ones, but mm -hmm. you know, it, it's something that you have to respect. And if they say, wow, you know, grandma's really sick, she's never going to wake up again, mm -hmm. well, I don't want her on a machine, uh, I think we better let her go. Mm -hmm. Well, you have to respect that decision. Mm -hmm. You might also say, you know, uh, you're 92 years old, you have a broken neck, we don't do surgery. You know, you may be paralyzed, you may die. And mm -hmm. she say, well, I'm 92, I have a broken neck, I may just die from this, I don't want surgery. Mm -hmm. You kind of have to respect that decision. So you don't really have the power of God in your hands, you can't make the decision for them. You let them know what they're looking at, what the cost of the decision is, and go through all the outcomes with them, and then you have to respect the patient's decision to proceed or not proceed with your recommendations or your mm -hmm. options for them. So it seems like you need to be a good communicator and be a resilient to be a neurosurgeon. Are there any other personality types or traits that you uh, recommend um, or that you see in medical students that would make good neurosurgeons? There are. I think every specialty has their own little stereotype. You know, and I think everybody knows that neurosurgeons are kind of like the workaholics and are kind of the gunners. Uh, they're much more competitive. Um, and I think that there is some truth to that. Mm -hmm. There are some exceptions. My senior partner, he's a very laid back guy. Uh, he definitely doesn't have that aggressive personality, mm -hmm. uh, but he's motivated and he's very intelligent and he is hardworking, but he, uh, he's m much more sedate and much more of a gentleman type. Mm -hmm. uh, in that sense, he's a very different neurosurgeon than I am yet he's as successful if not more so than I am. Than I am. Um, so in that sense, you know, is there really a one type of applicant or one student that we know should be going to neurosurgery and everybody else should go elsewhere? And the short answer is not really. You know, even amongst the neurosurgeons that I trained with, there's a huge variety of personalities and personality traits. I think motivation is a very strong one. I think the people who do go into neurosurgery, uh, they're very dedicated and they're very motivated to mm -hmm. get the job done, even if it's you know 8, 9 p.m. on a Friday afternoon or Christmas Eve, mm -hmm. if there's something happening, you know, you just roll up your sleeves and you do it. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that's a unifying denomination amongst the people that I've worked with in the past who are neurosurgeons. Some of them have big families, they have lots of kids, and some of them are single, they have no kids. And you know, mm -hmm. so I think it's doable. It just depends on each person. Mm -hmm. But as far as uh, personality types, for sure, I think the motivation and the, uh, and the desire to achieve a goal mm -hmm. is the one. Uh, there are some patients, uh, some uh, residents, some neurosurgeons who have great hands and are natural technical neurosurgeons, mm -hmm. and there are some who basically are all thumbs and they just have to work on it mm -hmm. to, to do the same job that the other guy would just mm -hmm. breeze through. Uh, but ultimately, the end result is what you're judge on. And if your patient does well, it doesn't matter if you were able to breeze through the surgery in 30 minutes or if it took you three hours, mm -hmm. the end uh, speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, in terms of uh, neurosurgery, yeah, I think there's a pretty broad um, variations in who is successful in neurosurgery. Mm -hmm. um, there's some common denominations. What things would you recommend we do, uh, med students do to get into a good neurosurgery um, residency? You mentioned things like sub eyes uh, and good letters. And things yeah, like that. so neurosurgery is a small field. There's about 3,000 neurosurgeons in a country uh, at any one time. And um, the ones that are in academic medicines, uh, they're all pretty much in a small circle. Even the ones in private practice, we know a lot of academic guys. So we all pretty much know each other. I still remember when I was in Virginia interviewing, um, I was sitting with the chairman and he picks up the phone. He calls my letter writers um, who, uh, you know, just say, hey, your boy's here. You know, uh, you know, he wants to come here and, and train as a neurosurgeon. So they start talking because everybody knows everybody. Um, so I think when you're in a closely knit uh, specialty like neurosurgery mm -hmm. where we really depend on each other I think uh, a sub eye is crucial towards getting almost a validation mm -hmm. you know so if you go to a university and you go there and you work real hard for one or two months um, and it shows then the people that you work with will probably know the people you're interviewing with for either residency or a job down the road mm -hmm. and if they can vouch for you, it goes a long way. Mm -hmm. uh, for people who apply to neurosurgery, um, sub eyes or early involvement in the field is important. So when I was a med student during my orientation week, I had already sent out letters to the neurosurgeons at my medical school and had met with a couple of them and then started working on projects at, as an MS1. Mm -hmm. And so by the time I was an MS3, I already had papers, I already had um, some clinical experience and had pretty much the frame of a really strong letter and doing sub eyes at visiting um, universities are pretty good uh, actually it's almost mandatory um, some places do want you to rotate there um, if you want to apply so University of Virginia classic place the interview is one week long so you have to go there you have to rotate and you must spend time there. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of places like UCSF or Barrels in Phoenix is very, very competitive. Mm -hmm. So most of the people who apply and get there, they probably didn't just apply. They probably had to rotate a month or two mm -hmm. um, to actually show their stuff so that they can actually choose the applicant they want. Mm -hmm. um, so sub eyes are crucial. Publications are important. Not everybody can get a first author lab in science. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of... A lot of um, Neurosurgeons, they do have um, basic science and research and things uh, in the lab, and those are really great uh, projects to get involved and get published, mm -hmm. but there are also many years of dedication and, and involvement, and you may start as MS1, and by the time you're MS4, they're not quite finished with the project yet, and you have mm -hmm. nothing. You know, so a lot of the publications that I've seen uh, by uh, successful applicants and that I've done is clinical papers. So. Mm -hmm case reviews, very small project that you can do over a month where you have interesting case and report it to either Journal of Neurosurgery or Neurosurgery or any other journals. Um, uh, case series where you just have you know, 10, 20, 50, 100 patients and you analyze them and you come up with your uh, contribution to the medical mm -hmm. um, community in terms of what, what you think the outcomes of your study shows. Uh, and those are pretty popular ways to get publications and a lot mm -hmm. of uh, physicians in academic or private medicine will do these projects. So there are good ways to to really enhance your 
CV to have publications, good letters, mm -hmm. um, and of course, the uh, away rotation at a place that mm -hmm. you really want to go to. And your surgery as a whole seems very intense. How would you recommend new doctors, or how do you stay on top of all the advances in neurosurgery? Basically, I read. I read nonstop. Uh, this is my New Year's reading that I'm taking home. <laughs> so I, I read nonstop. Uh, my textbooks I used to read, but now that they're all committed to memory, pretty much. I just read journals, uh, courses. Uh, you want to get board certified. There's maintenance certification, so um, you can do it to the national conferences, you can do local conferences, there's classes. Uh, for things like spine, there are a lot of cadaver courses where you would go and you would practice the newer techniques. Mm -hmm. uh, skull base, you would just practice on cadaver heads. Uh, a lot of universities, San Diego, UCSF, uh, Cornell, um, and University of Miami, they're big in classes for continuing medical education. Some of them are in the U.S. At the place like Cornell, they'll have their skull-based lab, and sometimes they'll have it in Costa Rica. So that's fine too, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, neurosurgery, once you finish residency, you will continue to learn, and you have to. If you only take what you learn from residency and apply it, you're probably not going to grow as a neurosurgeon, and, and you'll start regressing. So mm -hmm. the amount of neurosurgery that I do now compared to what I did in residency it's definitely a broader spectrum, A, because I have more independence, but also more responsibility, and B, because I get to branch out into things that I have more interest in. So I actually spend more time studying it and learning it, either through um, CMEs with the uh, major governing bodies, or taking courses, or just practicing on cadavers, practicing with other surgeons when I first started, uh, some of the vascular surgeries that I like. Um, it's a little more complex than you want to tackle right off the bat from graduation from residency. So there's a senior neurosurgeon in a different practice. I'll just join him and watch him do surgeries and assist on his and just kind of get a more comfortable feel until I'm ready to tackle it for myself. Mm -hmm. and, and those are definitely many ways you can kind of continue. But most importantly, I think most neurosurgeons would agree that we're lifelong students. We're never going to stop learning. Uh, we'll stop taking tests after a while. But you still keep um, reading, you keep studying, you keep learning, and you keep practicing. Mm -hmm. And so neurosurgery is so demanding um, through training and even after for, you know, for um, regardless of what practice setting you're in. How, uh, what are things that you've done to prevent burnout and what are tips that you recommend to prevent burnout and also establish a work-life balance? You know, uh, it's possible. Bur burnout is kind of a tough thing. Um, it's hard to define, and I think people know when they have it. Um, it's kind of hard. I think for someone like me, where neurosurgery is a, almost a second career, mm -hmm. um, and it's something that I've pursued more as a passion and less as a, um, as a, uh, uh, a line of work. Mm -hmm. So I don't depend on my work to pay my bills. Um, I think I do neurosurgery because I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a little harder for someone like me to get burned out. Mm -hmm. um, thankfully, my partner, he likes to work as well, and he likes spine, and we do a lot of spine together in our practice, and some of the spine is not really as interesting to me as it is to him, so I would tend to share some of those cases with him and have him take care of some of the patients that I may be less interested in caring for. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's less interested in cranial cases, so he'll send the brain tumors and aneurysms to me, and I'm very interested in taking care of those. Mm -hmm. So we, I think, at least in our practice, we do get that uh, luxury of cherry-picking what we like to do. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of patients where, well, no one really wants to do this, but uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's bread and butter, we have to do it, so we do it. So some of the simple cases, it's almost like uh, you just you just do it um, mm -hmm. because that's what the patient needs. Mm -hmm. um, and if you do nothing but those, I think you can get burned out. Mm -hmm. But you know, my partner and I were very very informal in our relationship. Mm -hmm. If uh, his friends come in by the town, he's on call. He just says, "Hey, Mike, can you cover this weekend?" And it's done. He has the weekend off. Mm -hmm. So I think. Having a good collaborative relationship with your practice partner also helps prevent burnout. Um, vacation time for my partner is whenever he wants to go. 
So he said, I'm going to go on vacation with my wife. Absolutely, just go. Um, it's a little bit less so for me. I have less interest in travels, so mm -hmm. I don't take as much time off, but I really don't have that concern about a burnout because mm -hmm. I think, you know, I, neurosurgery as a whole, I think, is so enjoyable to me that um, it's not really how I take a break, mm -hmm. but it doesn't, I don't need to take a break from neurosurgery. Mm -hmm. You know, for me personally, mm -hmm. uh, but I think there are people that may want to take a break, mm -hmm. um, and if they have time set up with their partners, I think that's easy to do. Mm -hmm. You know, my partner likes to golf and and fish and things like that, uh, mm -hmm. and that's fine. I like to watch motorsports, auto racing, and so I'll go to an auto race and it helps unwind. But for the most part, I think um, if you're passionate about it and if you love it, burnout is a lot harder mm -hmm. to. Uh, to mm -hmm. be stuck with. So New York is kind of like your career and your hobby? It, it's, it is a career, it is an interest. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wouldn't say hobby so much, but it's definitely a strong interest. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, sitting in an office or sitting in a hospital, filling out paperwork and mm -hmm. seeing patient after patient and just kind of troubleshooting things is work. Um, and if you're in surgery and you're doing a lumbar disc after lumbar disc and circle fusion mm -hmm. and the same thing in and out it does become work and it does drag a little bit mm -hmm. but I think having the brain tumors the aneurysms the um, some more complex cases some more fun cases more enjoyable cases they help rejuvenate that interest in neurosurgery mm -hmm. and get your juices flowing to the point where you don't uh, feel like man I'm just doing the same thing over and over again mm -hmm. Um, it, it does make it fresh again. It makes you fall in love with neurosurgery again. And I mm -hmm. think that's kind of where I've been lucky, where if things get a little boring after a while, I, I do get a chance to do some interesting cases and have some interesting patients and have uh, good outcomes and just really kind of feed off that reward mm -hmm. so that it allows us to uh, continue working in spite of uh, a long period to where we don't take breaks. It's mm -hmm. just something that just in of itself kind of a reward. So I'm not a great person to ask about burnout, uh, <laughs> but uh, I suspect it's not, it's not insignificant. Mm -hmm. um, but I think taking time for yourself, friends, families, travels is probably pretty important. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the best way to, I think, prevent uh, professional burnout is to actually make sure that this is what you want mm -hmm. because the time demands are so great that if you're not there voluntarily and happily, mm -hmm. uh, you may feel some degree of burnout. Mm -hmm. How has medicine changed in the last um, maybe a couple of decades, and where do you see it going in the next few decades? Technologically, medicine has changed a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I still have an x-ray box, because when I trained, we only had x-rays. We didn't have computers mm -hmm. with imaging study. Um, I still remember trying to decipher consult notes from other doctors on hard copies, mm -hmm. uh, because that's what was done when I was in residency. Uh, and in medical school. So electronic medical record and I think uh, electronic digital imaging really help improve and streamline uh, the care of patients in terms of complex patients, patients with long histories. I think that's really improved that. Uh, in terms of the practice of medicine, there are some negative aspects. I think the documentation has become so onerous. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of things you got to do because you got to meet this criteria, that criteria, that criteria. And a lot of times, it doesn't actually improve patient care, at least not from where I'm sitting. It may over the big picture, but the amount of documentation can be so extreme that you can spend almost more time documenting very small procedures uh, than doing the actual procedure itself. Mm -hmm. um, as far as other changes, you know, I think in Sacramento, where this is home of managed care, there is a change in how insurance is um, approved or not approved or mm -hmm. for surgeries and uh, consults and things like that. And with managed care, HMOs, a lot of the, um, the power of decision making has been taken away from doctors and mm -hmm. given to the insurance company. And most insurance companies, they do a pretty good job of making sure the patient gets what they need. They have doctors, and I'm also a volunteer for one of the larger insurance uh, panels in Sacramento. 
to decide, hey, is this really necessary? Is this needed for the patient? Or should they have something less costly? Mm -hmm. And the fact that some of the insurance panels have specialists like myself help make the decision means that for the most part, they are going to get the right care for the patient and they do care about the outcome of the patient. But there is some degree of frustration on the part of patients, referring doctors and specialists, mm -hmm. where we say, hey, this patient needs this thing. They need this surgery, they need this test, they need this uh, to see this doctor. And the insurance might say, well, before they do that, they need to have this, this, and this. And it, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you feel like it may delay care mm -hmm. and it may be trying to save money, mm -hmm. uh, which is probably what they're doing. But it, it can be a little frustrating sometimes. So mm -hmm. in that sense, I've seen more of that in the last few years. Mm -hmm. I think in the future, uh, at least in the surgical field, probably in the medical field as well, uh, instead of reimbursing for procedures performed, they will probably reimburse for outcomes. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of discussion about that and a lot of places are trying to look at outcomes mm -hmm. for patients. And based on patient outcomes, they will pay you mm -hmm. um, for the surgery you did. So mm -hmm. if you say, I took out a brain tumor, I should get this amount. Well, that's how it is now. So you take out a brain tumor, this is how much they pay for a brain tumor, that's how much you'll get. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what happens to the patient. Mm -hmm. Brain tumor is taken out, you did the surgery, that's your payment. In the future, they might say, you took out a brain tumor, patient had a stroke, they're now in rehab, they're in a wheelchair, that's not so good, we're only gonna pay you this amount and not what you want because your outcome is poor. Mm -hmm. you know? If you did great outcome, mm -hmm. I don't think I'll give you a bonus, but if you do poorly, if a patient doesn't do great, you do a lumbar surgery and a patient still has pain, they might say, I, I didn't feel like the surgery worked that well. Mm -hmm. uh, and they may actually start reimbursing mm -hmm. based on the outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, there's good and bad to it. It makes good sense that why would you get paid the same if you have one patient that does well and one patient mm -hmm. that doesn't do well. But at the same time, you also have different patients. One patient comes in and they have a small tumor. One patient has a big tumor and the patient with the big tumor has a poor outcome. That's not really because you did a poor job, it's because mm -hmm. that's the best job you can do given this mm -hmm. patient with the extreme surgery mm -hmm. that they required to get them this outcome, which is never going to be good. Mm -hmm. so you say, if you have this problem, you can only get this good. You can never be perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, and that type of reimbursement might say that, well, I know I'm not going to make this patient great. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll just send them to somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you may start seeing patients having their care delayed because mm -hmm. if I don't get paid, I know this patient's not going to do well mm -hmm. no matter who does the surgery. Well, then I don't want to do the surgery because mm -hmm. I'm basically not going to get paid for the surgery. I'm mm -hmm. taking all the risk. I may send them to the university and now everybody's going to university mm -hmm. and so now they're backed up and the patient mm -hmm. won't get the care in a timely fashion. Mm -hmm. So I think there is some negative aspects to that even though it does make intrinsic sense as to you want to pay proportional to mm -hmm. good outcomes and pay less for bad outcomes. Mm -hmm. And that could also be an issue with like patients with like lower socioeconomic status where they maybe have like lower outcomes or like less support to help. I think it will lose. create a lot of bias mm -hmm. uh, whether or not you intend to. Mm -hmm. You know, the more complex patients are necessarily going to have worse outcomes they may end up being funneled somewhere mm -hmm. where they may have to wait longer, mm -hmm. if at all. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so last question. Um, what tips would you give us to become good doctors? I'll tell you what I was told. Take care of the patient and take care of the OR schedule. Forget everything else. Mm -hmm. So uh, forget about other doctors. Forget about nurses. Forget about family. Forget about your stomach. Forget about sleep. You take care of the patient, and for surgeons, you make sure you protect the OR schedule. And that's for residents. As, as an attending, you can do whatever you want for, for OR schedule. You can cancel cases left and right. But ultimately, I think, you know, for a private practice doctor like myself, where I say I have no boss, in reality, I do. I mean, a patient is the boss, and they call the shots, and I guide them through that. And ultimately, the person I want to please the most is the patient. And if I take good care of them, and they're happy, Nothing else really matters. That's really all that matters. It doesn't matter if they live or if they die. It doesn't matter if they're paralyzed, if they have this problem or that problem. If they're happy and you did your best for them, 
Mm -hmm. um, I think most patients will understand that and they'll reward you um, with their trust. And mm -hmm. I think that's pretty important. And I think that's something that when it's two in the morning and you've got six pages going off and the mm -hmm. ER is calling and the transfer center is calling and your patient in ICU is crumping and you think, man, this is, this is horrible. You know, ultimately, if you just remember to take care of the patients, I think you can get through it. It's mm -hmm. a great final message. So thank you again, Dr. Chen, for uh, being part of this interview. Um, thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions for Dr. Chen, you can leave it down below in the comment section and um, I'll ask him and get back to you guys. Uh, you have a website that they could... Uh, we do. Uh, I'll give you the website information, but okay. it's capneurosurgeons.com, um, and I'll give you the link, and okay. then you just include it downstairs. Okay, and I can include it in the description box. Uh, thank you guys again for watching. Let me know who you'd like me to interview next, and have a great Easter day. Take care.